y'all just don't know how much you energize me. And you have a lot of supports in here, a lot of brothers that's willing to reach out to you and support you. I look in your eyes, and it's not that I get to live vicariously through your eyes, but you give me life. Because I, I'm just thinking back when I was in college, and Marquise and I were talking about this, and I talked to a few young brothers about this, and I said, we were just, we, I come from the generation of fight the power. And that was 1990, so I was, a, I was a 70s baby. 70s baby, growing up in the 80s, where we couldn't figure, it out, figure out if we was rap or pop or rock and roll. We was a little bit of Michael Jackson, we was a little bit of MJ, a little bit of LL Cool J, and a little bit of Culture Club all wrapped up at once. Y'all know about house music. <laughs> but we didn't get a chance to fight the power and start to really reap the benefits of this thing called affirmative action, civil rights, now social justice, until we made some noise in the 90s. So I'm going to take you there for a second. So I remember 1990, and the song was actually 1990, I was at Northeastern Christian Junior College, right down the street from here, which is now being built into a middle school in my school district. I went there because I was a Proposition 48 player, which means I had low SAT scores. Full ride to St. Bonaventure, couldn't take it. The A-10 at the time took two Proposition 48 players in the entire league. One of them from Simon Gratz was named Harry Moore. The other one was Aaron McKee. Choice is well done. <laughs> yeah, they deserve those two Prop 48 scholarships. If Aaron McKee walked through this door right now, I'm running, if with, the, with the basketball, I'm running that way. I couldn't do nothing with Aaron. And I went over to this junior college and I started to experience Ardmore and Villanova and said, man, I grew up right in Logan, right across City Avenue. I used to come to Ardmore to get clothes out of the thrift store. That little picture you saw, me the little suit while I was on my way to the masjid, we got that from the Lincoln Hall, the Lincoln Hall uh, thrift store over here on Montgomery Avenue. And I started to see in college, I said, guys ain't moving like me. I'm not going home. I can't fail. There's no way I can go back to Logan knowing I had the opportunity to go to college where the hood created a force field around me to get me out. For example, when I talked about Frankfurt High, I graduated from Omni. I went to Frankfurt, did ninth grade. Then I went to ninth grade again in Omni because I love ninth grade so much I did it twice. So <laughs> Y'all didn't catch that. <laughs> so what we would say back then, I was thugging, man. I've always been tall. So I was a 13-year-old hanging out with 17 and 18-year-olds. They used to call me Little Heart. They used to call me Pipe when I started playing ball. Little Heart, Little Pipe, Lid, Liddy. I did all these. So that's how you roll in the neighborhood. You fight, we fight. It's all in. We all in with it. We all in. If I didn't fight, I had an older sister. I had to deal with her when I got home. I take my chances outside. But it was all about the hood until I started to make that move in education. And in education, it started like this. My second time around in ninth grade, I met a teacher named uh, Mr. Dick Smith, Omni High. So I'm going to take y'all there. I got to do some academic stuff. I'm a superintendent. So Mr. Smith appeared in the classroom on a broom. And he's flying around the classroom, and he's chanting, double, double, toil and trouble, double, double, toil and trouble. And we said, Mr. Smith has lost his mind now. We finally got him. We got that ball. We crazy. We got him. And he said, listen here, guys, we're going to learn about the best rapper of all time. The best rapper of all time, William Shakespeare. We was like, man, get out of here, man. William Shakespeare, Airbnb, Rakim. Come on. Public enemy. You know what I mean? We talking about... LL Cool J. And they's like, and what about Big Daddy? Don't forget about Big Daddy. And they say, Lil hit it. So we hit the beatbox. Y'all don't do that no more. <laughs> and I just jump in and I would say, because I'm the, because I had hair back then. I had a high top, right? I had a high top with a part that went from here to here. I had three cuts on my eyebrow. So anytime you said Big Daddy, and he brought Dark Skin Brothers out, all right? Because the Light Skin Brothers was killing it with LL and the crew. But when I jumped out, they say, hit it, Lit. And I said, I'm the B-I-G, the D-A-double-D-Y-K-A-N-E, dramatic. 
Asiatic, unlike many. I'm different. So don't compare me to another. If they can't hang with my old heads, work to the mother. And that, like, yeah, yeah, Lynn, that's right, that's right, kick it. So we start kicking rhymes. Mr. Smith said, no, check out this poem. And he started reading the prologue to, to, to Macbeth. He's like, it rhymes, right? We was like, it got style, you know what I mean? It's style. He said, guess what? You just read a Shakespearean sonnet. And the Shakespearean sonnet is 14 lines in iambic pentameter. The rhyme scheme is A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. A must rhyme with A, B must rhyme with B. We get that, get that. The G, G, not only does it rhyme, but it tells you the meaning of the poem, which is the meaning of the play. You just unlock your first Shakespearean work. So we're going to read Macbeth. Which version do you want? You want the comic book version or you want the unabridged version? What's the unabridged version? So back then we had Webster dictionaries back then. You look up unabridged. Oh, yeah, this is the version that, they, that they're reading at LaSalle College Prep High School. Which one you want to read? We want to read that one. We want to read the one that they're reading. And we went through and we started to focus in on Macbeth. And from there, I got that bait. He, th he threw that bait out there for me because I, I was like, man, I can actually sit in a Shakespearean works and understand the play if I can unlock the sonnet. So I was at Temple University taking on Othello in 11th grade and the multiple personalities of King Othello sitting there with my crew from the Burbs and I'm sitting there from Logan rocking Othello. I was prepped out by then. That's when we rocked polka dots. Rock my polka dots and my little square glasses. And I thought I was smart, but I thought I was smart because these educators surrounded me and they saw something in me that I didn't see. I had a little job. I was working my way through the neighborhood. I was getting better as a basketball player. And things started to take off. So when I got to college, I said, okay, I made it. I went to junior college, started getting three eights and three nines, voted most likely to succeed at Northeastern Christian. I end up at Shippensburg University, full ride. Dropped my scholarship at Drexel because I couldn't find a degree. Had a full ride to Drexel. Thank goodness for Marquise's alumni brother, and I tell this story often. Back in the day, it, I was on the telephone right down here on Montgomery Avenue on the phone with Coach Bill Herrian. And he said, Khalid, I need you to make a decision today. I had two cell phones, I mean, two, two pay phones rocking. And he said, I need you to make, make a decision today, or I'm going to have to invest this scholarship in this young brother, this young player out of engineering and science. And this young player ended up being the all-time leading rebounder in college basketball history. So every time I see him, I let him know, if it wasn't for me, <laughs> he wouldn't have been that great. And played for the Spurs. He played for the Spurs and still playing to this day. He's, uh, he's, he's on the sideline. So I thought by getting a 3-9 and going to Shippensburg on a full ride, and eventually, a couple of years ago, I was named the first African-American um, African -American male as alumni of the year, the Higus Award. I got that. I thought, when they called me for that, I thought I still owed some tuition or something. But um, I got that award, and I was wondering why. Because I think you were there for that, Keith, and when the... the um, the, uh, um, um, the, the, the chaplain on campus, she's been there forever. She remembered me. You know how she remembered me? Because I was cool with the president. I was a parliamentarian in multicultural student affairs, started some programs that Marquise was running up there back 25 years ago, 30 years ago, men of culture, that was us. And what she remembered me by is because I was fighting the power. I'm up at Shippensburg and dozen, there's not many people that look like me. And if you do look like me, you don't even speak to me. We just walk past one another like you don't exist. Back in the day, I'm like, they're lost. They forgot where they came from. I refuse to ever do that. And we got into it over two things. There were three things that happened in my college career that were paramount. One, rappers started wearing big, gaudy symbols. Gucci, Timberland, Tommy Hilfiger, Nautica. And they came out of their mouths and said, we don't make clothes for that demographic because they start seeing their rap videos. 
We don't make clothes for that demographic. So Public Enemy says, shut them down. So we shut them down, shut them, shut them down, I shut them down, shut them down, shut them, shut them down, we shut them down. And we shut the economy down on that. We're the only ones that wear Timberlands 365 days a year. They don't make clothes for our demographic. We shut Timberland down. As we say in Philly, we shut them down. They was down. And what happened, they came out with a campaign, kick the boot on racism, with the boot hanging off of the billboard. You can't find nothing in Timberland that ain't got a tree on it this big. But they didn't make clothes for that demographic back then. Gucci, you couldn't find Gucci with all these symbols. That was rap. Gucci was discreet. Everything's big and gaudy. Hilfiger ain't make it back. <laughs> Nautica ain't make it back. Everyone else, they had to change and conform and start to talk about our economic power. That's one. The second thing that happened, we had the O.J. Simpson trial. And I was in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, in Chambersburg Mall, when the verdict was read. And it was bananas. It was bananas in a sense of seeing, seeing people, of white people cry and black people celebrate over a murder conviction or court case. It was so polarizing. You start to see the divide. Like these are the same cats that I walked with in school that I work with, and I can't believe we're on two separate sides of this issue. Was it really about the murders? We don't really know the ins and outs of that. It was us thinking about how the system has treated us. So as you move through education, you think things get better. They actually get a little worse because you start to talk a little different. So you got a master code, shift, uh, co code shifting. You still try to have your swag, but can't say, uh, <laughs> your swag, you still suburban. You get to a point when you graduate, you start talking about dollars and cents. That's real. It's a real conversation to have. And it's necessary. And sometimes, but I would always say, you can't lead, you know, you can't lead what you don't know, and you can't go where you're afraid, you can't lead what you don't know, and you can't lead where you're afraid to go. So that was my hood. I'm all right in my hood. I ain't DMX by any means, but I'm good in my hood. But I know when the lights go down, I need to get up out of there, because it started to close in on me. I'm 50 years old now. I don't know none of those young boys out there. But the key is being able to reach back and take the time to mentor. So another thing that was a life-changing event was this. So I'm going to talk about the career path and connections and mentorship and how important this is. So I told you when I was in Shippensburg, I forgot to tell you I grew three inches <laughs> from junior college to ship, and I was a guard. I ain't had much of a handle, but I could take off. I can get my shoulder over the rim. The tall young man you saw in the video is one of yours. That's, that's, that's Villanova graduate Jason Lawson. That's my young, that's my young boy. He was uh, here, graduated uh, Jason, 7'2", from my hood, good young man. But basketball at the time, my options for professional ball were Venezuela, which is tier three. Now you have the, now you have the D leagues. We didn't have D leagues. Tier three, you want to go tier one because you can make a career out of that, that's Italy, and that's Turkey. I wasn't tier one, I didn't get that. One opportunity happened right here in Villanova that I had to make a decision. Actually two, the Globetrotters over here, and I have a friend, the point guard, one of the point guards for the Globetrotters, one of my, one of my close friends, Chris Franklin, we came up this, oh yeah, Handles my man. Yep, Handles is my man. Handles went to Lock Haven. And I was at ship. So during when we graduated, we had Globe Trotters tryouts. He was in the league that went overseas, and then he moved into Globe Trotters. And I got selected for and one that started here in Villanova. And <laughs> and here in Villanova, that was the beginning of street ball. And I was like, man, I ain't gonna just be running around dunking and all that. And one, and then Kevin Garnett jumped on it in the blue. And so my education 
when leaving, uh, leaving Northeastern Christian, going over to Shippensburg, getting three eights and three nines, fifth year, I'm on a full academic scholarship, and I'm rolling with the president, and he said, I'll help you any way I can. I said, sir, thank you so much. I just need, you know, reference letter. Okay? I kept it there. Two, he loved me because they used to call me bean pie. I'm like, yo, can we get some turkey up in here? Everything's pork. We need turkey. So I was pushing that envelope, too. One of the things that's paramount about Shippensburg University, we marched, on the, we marched on campus because Dr. Martin Luther King's birthday was not a holiday. We marched. A couple of Confederate flags came out. Allegedly, some things got burnt up. But we made change. To this day, it's a holiday. man. But I move on. I have Diane Jefferson in Shippensburg who mentored me. I get to, uh, get to my first year of teaching at Scotland School for Veterans Children. A governor by the name of Governor Tom Ridge wanted to watch me teach. I didn't even, I had no political acumen. I had no idea who Tom Ridge was. I don't need to, the governor wants to teach in your class. I'm raising my hand. I said, yeah, you can come teach in my class. Oh, yeah, met with the governor. He's cool. They're like, what? He taught, I taught in front of him, he sat there. He said, son, good job. You ever need anything, call me. Okay, what did the governor say to you? He told me to call him and write him. What, I said, man, yeah, governor, yeah, he cool. Didn't know that Tom Ridge was an ultra conservative and dealing with the virtues of education. Didn't matter, he was a decent dude. So I go for my first job, full job. Central York Middle School, first black teacher in Central York Middle School, and this is 1995. My reference list, President Setia from Shippensburg, Governor Tom Ridge, <laughs> and Diane Jefferson. They called me into the interview because they thought that my resume was fake. And they called the governor's office, they called President Setia's office, and of course they called Diane Jefferson, and they said they were talking about you like you were sitting next to them. That's where my career took off. Governor Ridge came back a year later, videotaped my class. It's a unit called Patton now for professional development. Back then it was called DVSMAC, something, 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 something. And I was on a video to create Pennsylvania State Standards in English. I was a teacher for five years, a dean for two. Oh, thank you, Ben. A dean for two. <laughs> but I had this engine in me because I was about diversity back then. I was about diversity. So I went multiculturalism and diversity. So I went to Mannheim Central and I was one of like six black people in Mannheim Central, the only one in the school district. But I wanted to practice this diversity platform I had. I was there for two years and then ended up in Centennial School District in Bucks County. Now, for an educator, any of you that are educators in the state of PA, you've made it when you made it to Bucks or Montgomery County. You've made it. Okay? You made it. I got there, didn't even know how much I was being paid. I had a mentor, Dr. Carol Saylor, Dr. Emily Lenardi, who's a retiring superintendent over here in Downingtown. And I basically was hooked in with cage busters. You'll know this language when you start talking about Mary Wollstonecraft and the vindication of women's rights. I had these white, older white women that, said, that felt as though they moved like me. And they put me on the back of their car and they just took me. I was rolling with all white women. Pay attention to this. Because brothers that looked like us, we didn't connect with one another. We didn't talk to one another. We didn't support one another and try to create our own networks back then. We were so busy being individuals and just trying to fit in and assimilate but as a professional, these are the white women that open these doors for me. So I roll into Mannheim Central. I get to Berks, Bucks County, Centennial School District. I start my doctorate at the University of Pennsylvania. And I wanted to challenge the norm of how do you get the central office? Average years were 17 years. Everywhere I've been, I've been the first or the only. My research was about recruitment, retention, and hiring of African-American males in suburban school districts. I got into Bucks County in, in, in 12 years, and the average years were 17. I got there in 12, because I was pressing the envelope. Because I see that we didn't have a lot of educators that were focusing on us. 
and I'll get to wear it on my sleeve. I digress and take you back to Mannheim Central because I need to tell you this. You don't lose who you are. I had a, a supervisor say to me, why do you wear suits every day? It was the same suit. I was mixing it up, you know, playing around with it a little bit, a couple of suits. You dress for success. That's what we have to do. We got to be 10 steps ahead of the game. He said, we wear khakis around here. I said, I've never owned a pair of khakis in my life. <laughs> and that back then, I didn't wear my polo tops tucked in. I ain't do that. That ain't my style. Now, I was wearing silk sets. I mean, you know, I'm coming from Philly. <laughs> Boys to men, you know. So I wore, I wore colorful glasses. I was, you know, I, I'm on that Jay-Z crap right now. I was wearing Pachotti before even people know what Pachotti was. I was wearing Masuda, Masuda glasses, getting them out of New York before people knew what they were. Because I had to wear glasses. I wanted to be stylish. I wanted to be myself. I started wearing gold finches, the old school Malcolm X glasses. Because that's how I felt. And I didn't care what people thought. I said, I'm on this level. I'm here. In education, I started to see that this is a place where I fit, where I love going to work every day. But this is when the rubber meets the road. I became a superintendent. And then I said, oh, snap. I'm trying my best, but this system ain't for us. My research says it. I've seen it, but now I'm part of the decision making in it. It's not designed for any of us in this room. I'm going all the way back to John Dewey, 1916, the democracy of education, where education actually loosened up a little bit to let some difference, some difference in the room. Still wasn't made for us. So you have movements that come along. And everybody, we talk about Brown versus the Board of Education, 1954, Topeka, Kansas. But that was to desegregate schools when the data was better when schools were segregated. Think of this. Think of this. Segregation offers its hands to assimilation if there's no, no pressure to help us to be a part of the culture, not just blend in. I'm talking about moving from the America's the great big melting pot. Y'all remember that? Think of a melting pot. You put the ingredients in and they assimilate. They form one. Then we went from the melting pot to the salad bowl. You know, everybody has their own unique texture. That was diversity. It's diversity. Then we moved to, we don't, we don't do the salad bowl, we're salsa. You know, we're salsa. That's equity. So we should be happy. But what's the fight for now? The fight is for sustainable social justice. As you sit in this room, or we all sit in this room, as men of color, we can march it on down over in the Overbrook. It's about a quarter of ten. We can take it on downtown. We can roll up. Let's just roll up in Brickyard and, and, and roll up in Brickyard in G-Town. And all of our colors are stripped of us because our lives are on the line. We're social justice. There are people in this world that hate your mere existence. Not even the fact that you made it. They hate your mere existence. The only example I can give, I'm an English teacher, so I gotta give this analogy. When I lived on the Eastern Shore of Maryland, the Eastern Shore of Maryland, you get to see bald eagles all the time. Bald eagles are serious. They're not the US symbol for no reason. They are intense predators. And for you city boys, if you've never seen a bald eagle, think of a, think of a pug standing up on his legs with legs like a terrier and talons as big as my hands. And when they come to eat, they eat. And these eagles were circling and they went down into a flock of white snow geese. I never seen anything like it. I'm old school. So it reminds me of the game Millipede. Remember Millipede? Oh no, Galac Galaca. Yeah, and they start spinning and that's how they did it. They circled 
and they went down and got these snow geese. Meanwhile, the buzzards are on the side, and these are the huge birds you see on the side, the expressway eating roadkill. Every time the eagle would turn, the eagles would turn, they would get out of their sight. They didn't even want to be in their sight. This is how intimidating eagles are. They sat in this field. I was, Easter Shore is rural. It's a beach town. It's, it's rural. They ate at least 30 or 40 geese and let the little ones fly off. They ate all the big ones and let the little ones fly off. Why is that? Why did they let them fly? And I'm a poet, so I'm writing. And I said, this is survival of the fittest. But what happens to those young geese that fly away? Many of them are just flying away to get fatter to be prey. But what about the ones that make it? That's how dire this is. God has given you the opportunity to fly off. And when they fly off, it's, very, it's poetic because they're not graceful. They're all over the place. And the eagles could go and get them so easily. But they let them go. But what happens with nourishment and protection, nourishment and protection, that snow goose or snow geese, they'll be able to grow. And they'll be able to navigate when they hear the sounds of a damn eagle coming to get them. That's how serious this is. That's why I'm here today. That's why I, don't, I can't be cussing on the microphone because I am in my district. I use profanity sometimes. But that's why I'm here today. Because y'all give me life. Y'all in Villanova. When you come to Villanova, not simply for young people who look like you, people who don't look like you wish they were here and they've made it. I got kids in Lower Marion that can't get into Villanova. And they live here. This is a special opportunity for you. Why I roll like this? I've been in that spot. And this, I tell you these stories so that you can navigate. We got a saying in the hood, you gotta keep your head on a swivel. Everything, you got some athletes in here. It's, every sport has the same athletic stance. Your head's on a swivel. That's your free safety, that's your linebacker, that's your defender, you're on a swivel. That's your life. When I got my degree out of Shippensburg, and we had a rapper called Master P, I modeled my game at the Master P. I had resumes in my trunk. I had suits in my trunk with chains of shoes and ties. I could be out partying one night, and if I got an interview the next night, boom, bathroom near you, I'm dressed, and I'm there. That's why my, my small company is on-demand, in-demand leadership, plug and play, I'm ready. I got that from Master P. But what happens is this. I had a Honda Accord back in the day. And you could steal a Honda in under less than a minute back then. You didn't have to even pop it up. All you need is a screwdriver. Allegedly, that's what I heard. <laughs> and so what you would do, you will take, take that screwdriver, hit it right in the tumbler, and start the Honda right up. Boom, 30 seconds, you're gone. I'm a college graduate. I'm going to let y'all know I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm 50 years old, y'all, all right? So you're out there with me. My Jersey City partners will know this. Remember my brother from Newark in here. He'll understand this. I had me a Honda Accord anniversary edition sitting on some Momos. Momos, used to roll on those in, in Newark. Brick City. Red Man used to always have Momos in his video. And my car got stolen. Now, stolen car, living in Logan. I could find where my stolen car was because I had some information from the barbershop, allegedly. And I found my car. Found my car. I'm a college graduate. And I couldn't take it. I lost it. And this, I'm going to end on this in about five minutes. 
I lost it. And everything I put in with six, with high school and then five years at the university level and working on getting my first job, I'm still, I got, I got five toes here trying to get professional, and I still got five toes in the street because I just lost. I thought I had ten toes over here. So their college changed me. It didn't. And I ran up in this boy's house. Ran up in his house. I couldn't take it. Broke into my car, man. He stole my stuff, stole all my CDs. CDs are obsolete now. Stole my CDs, everything. Stole my degrees, everything. Stole my clothes, my everything. And I still remember to this day, we were on Chu and Haynes. And there's a bridge there, Chu and Haynes. And I saw this dude that stole my car. Well, the cops locked him up that time. But I saw him. I was at, chilling at the Arboretum. I didn't even want that car no more, so I got rid of him, got a path on him. And I'm sitting under this bridge, and this young man walked past me, 17-year-old crackhead. And I'm looking like, so some things did happen to him, allegedly, under that bridge. I had some friends with me, and, you know, sometimes things get a little hot. And we sat back and we debriefed. And I said, man, I got some role. I can't be, I got a college degree. I can't be doing this. I said, this kid on crack, black man on crack, young black man, 17. I wasn't even thinking about drugs like that. He crazy. And I said, I got to leave. So there's a song by Raphael Sadiq. It says, I'm leaving this town. I thought he wrote that for me. I'm leaving this town. I'm moving uptown. I'm leaving this town. And so I was at the Reader's Water Ice Stand. And I'm now, again, a college graduate, exercising my First Amendment rights. I got my First Amendment rights. And this same young man pulled a gun on me. It's a true story, y'all. Pulled a gun on me at Haynes and Stanton, the Chinese store. I'm a college graduate trying to get my first job. And he pulled it and it jammed. An old rusty revolver. I looked right at it. He pulled it and it jammed. Then he dropped the gun and he ran. Adrenaline, because right when he pulled it, my boy said, Lid, he got a gun. And I'm standing there like, I cannot believe that this boy can really shoot me. And I ain't got my thing on me. I reached for my thing. I have it. I was getting water ice. <laughs> I'm licensed to carry. Oh, whoa, ain't got no gun. I got on a holster with no gun. Shame you got to carry a gun around your own people. He pulled it on me. It jammed, he dropped the gun, and some things happened. And in that moment while things were happening, I just was like, just that fast. I said, I'm leaving. I left maybe four days later, I left. I just got him packed up. I had a job, I was playing Will Chamberlain League. Got a call that I had a job in Chambersburg, that school at Scotland School for Veterans Children, and I left. Got a cedar chest from Palmyra, the Palmyra flea market, sanded it, shellacked it, put everything in it, put my boom box on top, in the back of my car, and I left. Because I've reflected. I said, God has me here for a reason. Because I could have been, my mom would have killed me. I wouldn't have been 17 on crack. But I could have been 17 in the streets and lost. And the worst thing that could ever happen is an up-and-coming black man kill a young black man. And that moment changed me. That's why I always say, when I see black men like yourself, I always say, I love you. It's like this brother said. And it's authentic. Because as I told Keith 10 minutes ago that I was ending, this is the analogy, I, the, the, the image I want to give you. No matter how successful you are, no matter how privileged you become, how much money you get. We just saw Will Smith freak out the other day. Everything he's done in entertainment, now they're going to take him down, trying to take him down. That's just one very high paramount example. 
But just think of it. We constantly walk the tightrope. Our backs are up against the wall. You got to really embrace this. There's a saying, and I use it often, I'm very uncomfortable in diff- I'm very uncomfortable in uncomfortable situations. I can fail a test because the test ain't got no bullets in it. It ain't going ain't gonna to kill me. I'll be all right. Persevere. Ain't nothing that can stop me. It's like, you know, God is rolling with me. I was a preemie. That little picture you saw was a second trimester baby. I'm here for a reason. My mom named me Khalid because Khalid means everlasting. I didn't know no better back then. It took me a while to become a young adult to figure out that I'm here for a reason. So as a black man or a man of color, when you're walking this race, no matter how successful you are, no matter how, how you, there, there, there's some subtle reminders. I ain't going into all those stories. There are reminders that let you know blank stay in your place. You'll know what I'm talking about when you get there. But always realize this. We walk the tightrope. This is us in life. Professional. This is us. This is us, okay? No matter how successful you are, you slip and fall, you go right back to where you began because the system was designed to have you there anyway. Read the bell curve theory. The bell curve theory tells you what your your trajectory is because your skulls are too small, you're African American, and some of you grew up in poverty, you fail. Three X's, you done. Single parent households, <clears throat> you done down this drain. So the expectations are low. Never forget that tightrope. Now here is the challenge when you walk that tightrope. And this is why we loved our old shows back in the day. You know how I walk the tightrope now? I walk it like George Jefferson. <laughs> Some of them call Obama. I walk that rope straight. I come through the room. I know exactly what I'm doing. I know, forget about the seat at the table. I don't give a shit where I sit. I'm the head of the table. Wherever I sit, wherever I sit, people get fired up about that. That's traditional, in the box. What do you mean? You want to sit at the head of the table? I'm comfortable right here because I'm the head of the table. All right? I walk into meetings. I always walk in on time. <laughs> Thank you, brother. I'm going to end this. I'm never too early. I'm always on time and I leave late. You know why? Because when I walk in, I know the meeting ain't starting until I get there. That's the type of confidence you have to exude. And I know that I can sit in a room with my brothers and my sisters that could come from bottom side or North Philly and I'm, in my, I'm comfortable in my skin. And I know when I have to sit at that executive table and I gotta pull that pen Quaker docker out of my back pocket, I can sit there too. Because I know how to code shift. I know how to take them on that journey up here. You wanna talk about research? I'll kill you with it. You wanna talk about athletics? I got that too. You wanna talk about the hood? I got that too. You wanna talk about di- diversity, equity, inclusion? I live that. You talk about that too. You want to talk about going from civil rights to diversity, multiculturalism, equity, to social justice? That's where I need you. Because I'm on the back of that train with you.